Um, so this morning we were going to we're going to talk about stores. So over the last few weeks we talked about um, we talked about schools, we talked about toys, we talked about chores, we talked about food preparation. On the Pioneer Times, we mentioned the general stores a couple of times. You, if I say general store, what do you think that means? Yeah, go ahead. It's just us, so you can just speak whenever. <laughs> um, like you do it like mostly like every day. Mhm. Mm and do you? What do you think is sold in a general store? Like groceries. Groceries? Yeah. Do you think maybe it has a little bit of everything? So, yeah. What was the last store you visited? We went to this store that made masks because um, me and Jackson need masks, so when we um, go out in public, yeah. yeah, because we need kid ones, so. And does that store have just masks? Uh-huh. It's a lady yeah. mask. It's not How like would you... it's just at our house. Yeah. Um, how would you feel if that mask store also had meat? Would that be That'd a bit weird? That would be weird. What if it had chicken food? or rakes for the garden. That doesn't really fit in, does it? Yeah. Well, in the pioneer time, we only had one store for everything. So each community would have one store that would sell everything. Because we didn't have, like today we go to the mall or we go to the, you know, I, right beside where I live, there's probably about 27 stores and one big complex. We didn't have that 100 years ago. So in the pioneers lived in, in Langley, and all across Canada, they had one little general store for the whole community. But those stores shared a lot of different <laughs> purposes. So it wasn't just about shopping. They were also community gathering places. So you would go, so you and Daxton would go together with your mom and maybe your dad. You guys, there'd be some toys to look at in the store, but they wouldn't, you wouldn't be allowed to touch them because they'd be really expensive. But your mom would go and she would pick up some flour and some rice, anything that you guys didn't have on the farm. Your dad might be looking for some tools for the garden, or maybe he needed some grains to feed the chicken. All of that would be available at one store. But how do you get to the store today? You need to go to the store. How do you get there? In our car. In a car? So did the Pioneer kids have cars? No. So they would have had to walk or ride their horse. So maybe a horse and a buggy would take the family to the store. What about, if there's something in the store you can't find? I know, I've done this twice this week. I've picked up my phone, I've gone to Amazon, and I've bought some stuff. Do you think you could do that in the Pioneer Times? No. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> so at the general store, if they didn't have anything you really wanted or you really needed, it was ordered from a catalog. You know what a catalog is? What do you think? <laughs> no, Jackson's not so sure. Okay, you've seen Amazon, right? You've seen online, all the little ads. So imagine that what you're looking at on Amazon with all the little photos of what you can buy is in a book, like a magazine. That's what a catalog is. And catalogs were still around. They were around for a long time. I know when I was a kid, we had catalogs. We, we had internet and stuff too, of course. But we did still get the Sears catalog. And it was very special. Because the Sears catalog would come at our door, especially close to Christmas time. And if there was anything really special that we wanted to save up for, we could go in the catalog, see how much it cost, fill out the form, take it to the store, and there was order it for us. But it wasn't very instant. I know the stuff that I bought on Amazon this week came to my door within two days. Do you think it came in fast in the Pioneer days? No. Where do you think it came from? So if you're a kid in Langley and you had to order a special toy, where is it coming from? China. China. It wasn't coming from China because did we have lots of airplanes 100 years ago? No. So there was only very early airplanes 100 years ago. There wasn't a big commercial jet. Have you ever been on a plane? Lots. Yeah. So lots of times. 
So those were around 100 years ago. So we didn't have airmail. Today, if you order something from China, it gets put up in a factory. It gets parceled up with your address on it. It gets shipped on a plane or on a big boat. And then it gets driven to your house or to your post box. But in the pioneer days, it all had to come by train or by truck or even by horse in the smaller community. And none of that came from overseas because we didn't have the big folks, or sorry, the big planes to come in. So the factories and the, the, the big stores were in places like Montreal. So if you ordered a special toy from the Sears catalog, you had to fill out a form, take it to the store, to your general store. They mailed it to Montreal. They prepared your order by hand. They put it up in a post box. They shipped it by train all the way across Canada. And then when it came in, it went to the store and you had to keep checking every single week to see if it was there. But sometimes, like today, what I ordered on Amazon took three days to come to my house. It took up to three months to get something on the Pioneer Day. So you really had to think in advance and plan ahead. Now, I'm gonna show you a little video have you been to have you been to our museum? I can't remember. No. Okay. Well, my friends, I have a treat for you. You get a private screening of a video that we just made this week. Since our museum is still closed, we made a little video, a couple of our volunteers in the general store. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Okay, awesome. So these are two of our volunteers, and we're gonna do a little bit of a tour of the general store, okay? Museum. I'm Melissa. I am a docent here at the museum. I have been docenting you might want to turn your as an educator all the way up. for oh, 10, 13. I'm not even sure because it's so much fun and I just keep coming on back. Today we will be walking through the Noel Booth General Store. And with me I have another docent. Hi, my name is Midori. I'm also a docent at the Langley Centennial Museum. I first became a docent uh, in the mid-1990s, had to take a break, and I missed it so much, I came back a few years ago uh, to join the docent program again. And we are outside the general store, as Melissa mentioned, which is one of my favorite exhibits in the museum, and we do use it in our school program. So, we, Melissa, are you ready to go into the general let's store? Let's go, let's go. in the store, you would have to ask the store owner or perhaps the store owner employed a clerk 
who worked behind the counter and you could point to what you wanted to look at and they would bring it down off the shelf or out from behind the glass cabinet for someone to look at and if you liked it then you would pay for it. And as Melissa said, it is organized, it's a small store, making good use of space. It is organized into different areas. On, on our left here, we have some toys and china behind the glass to keep it safe and dust free. I love the china dolls right in the bottom. Can the camera catch that? They are porcelain heads, very fragile. They're not like your stuffed animals today, but they were very, um, used lovingly and a lot of times they just actually sat on your shelf because they were fragile. We have tea sets, we have checkers, uh, little banks and an abacus. On the back wall here we have, uh, because there was no electricity, we have the old lamps, um, some of the hardware that the guys would use to come in and get for their uh, farm machinery, uh, use it within the gardening. Uh, moving onwards, <clears throat> I don't think we can quite see yet, but uh, we have boxes of different um, spices. Uh, I think, Majori, you can show the spices a bit better than I Now, some of you are watching this may be too young to go grocery shopping by yourself. And some of you may have been grocery shopping for way too long. That's the way I feel sometimes. And there are some brands here that we still have today in our grocery stores. Of course, this does not look like the grocery stores that we have now. Again, you would have to ask, you would have to specifically ask someone that worked in the general store, you know, for the, the can of nabob cayenne pepper or coriander seed or celery seed. Uh, we still have these spices today. The packaging may be different, the brand name may be different, but you can still buy them in grocery stores. But in the pioneer days, um, people weren't growing these herbs. When many of them were not growing these herbs in their yards or gardens, and they may not have had the means to be able to dry them properly. So they still had to buy things like flavorings and herbs and seasonings. And they'd also come to the general store, and behind the counter would be large sacks of flour or sugar. Again, not on the shelf for you to help yourself. You would have to ask someone for them. Uh, and pretty much everything up here. Oh, hey, root beer flavoring. <laughs> I just find the packaging is so interesting, like some are still in the paper, the metal, even the flower, the flower sack, <laughs> or glass, glass bottles and jars, no plastic in the pioneer days. Um, and the other thing is, some of these, the, um, the name of the company is the same, but certainly they changed the logo on that one. And look at that price, Melissa, 13 cents. When last time you bought pepper from the store, what did it cost? Not 13 cents. Was it more than 13 cents? Of course it was, yes. Oh, we have a price list here. There. There's a price list in case anybody wants to know. Can you guess what it would cost to buy a package of a package of jello in the Pioneer Day? Well, I think a package of jello today is a dollar sixty something mm -hmm. wherever you go. Pretty what much. was it back then? Well, according to this, on the price list from the 1920s, and the 1920s is considered the pioneer era yeah. in Langley, one package of Jell-O, 10 cents. <laughs> oh, okay. just 10 cents for Jell-O. All the little kids, kids would be going, Mommy, I want more Jell-O. <laughs> well, people didn't, with inflation, they didn't make as much. No. Food. What do you pay for, you bake, what do you, what do you usually pay for, say, a dozen eggs? Ooh. I haven't honestly baked for a while. Oh, really? I'm so busy. Yeah. yeah. I know you bake. What did you pay? Uh, I think the last time, the 1,000 large eggs was about $4 if that I don't buy right. organic. That sounds right. Now, yeah. on this price list, for three dozen eggs, $1. So that would mean about Maybe. 33 cents for yeah. a dozen eggs. Yeah. That's if you weren't raising your own chickens in the pioneer time. Right. And right. raising your own chickens and having your own eggs at home. Um, do you drink tea? Of course, yeah. Okay, now we do buy tea differently, and tea would have been also carried in the... Is there some coffee up here? Is there some tea some pins tea. over here? There is. Okay, yep. Yep. so if this was the 1920s and you were coming to the general store, for three pounds of tea, you would need to have one dollar. Well, on this tin from Ridgeway's Tea Company, it's 25 cents per half Pounds. Oh, okay. so it, it varies too, it but I know it's, it depends on the tea today. It's six dollars for the box, roughly, okay. per se. But I noticed next to you, you have 
a catalog. Mm -hmm. I know when I... Hey, so I'm just going to stop for a second. Before we look at the catalog, so I just want to talk about the money for a second. So things seem pretty cheap, right? Like 30 cents for a dozen eggs? And those are farm fresh eggs too. Those are not coming from by train or by boat or from far away. I know if I want to go to the store and I want to buy some good eggs that have come from a farm, I'm paying about six dollars. But what we need to understand though too, especially before we look at the catalog, is that money was worth a lot more back then too. And do you think the pioneer families had a lot of money? What do you think? Well, you don't have um, it. Well, you gave it to her. Yeah, so there probably wasn't a lot of money going around, but the money then, so just to think about this for a second. So in 1920, that's a hundred years ago, one dollar would have been equal to $13 today. So I'm thinking about mm, what might cost $13 today? Maybe, maybe a cheap pair of shoes from Walmart. Or maybe two books? No, maybe one book. One book from chapters is about $13. So that's about $1 100 years ago. $10 100 years ago is like about $130 today. So if you're talking about something that's worth 5 or $10, that's quite a lot of money, right? Okay, I'm just going to go back to the video here. I was growing up, I loved the Sears Christmas catalog. Oh, the Wish catalog. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And I still have my, the last one that they came up. I kept that because that's me in the history with the museum. I just had to keep it. This one I think is from Eaton, as I uh, recall. Let me see. Let's see. Tell me. This, is, top, a this is the top copy. Top. The Great Price Maker. Sears. It's, it is Sears. It is Sears. It's an old Sears. 1906. Copy of a Sears robot. Now, the general store carries a lot of items. It does. A lot of different items. But they didn't carry, they did not carry everything in stock. So, Melissa had pointed out the porcelain doll earlier. That is obviously something that would have been purchased from a store or ordered from a catalog. You would not be making that at home. No, and I also mentioned I need, need, need new shoes. Okay. <laughs> So shoes. I would go through the catalog and look for shoes. The general store might have a few pairs of shoes in stock, but you'd probably have to look through the catalog, order your shoes from the catalog, and wait for them to come to the general store. Now, were you wanting, for your shoes, were you wanting lace-up or was that button? I would take either, but I do prefer the lace-up. And you can see the prices are in this, that the shoes in the 1920s um, were all around just under $2, up to about... Two dollars and oh, thirty cents, and these sort of fancier, taller leather boot types would have been closer to three dollars or four dollars in the pioneer times. Now, with these ones, you have to remember in the pioneer times as well, mm -hmm. no vinyl. No, your shoes and boots would all have been made out of leather. Here on the counter, that Melissa is standing behind them. Um, now I know what they are from doing the, from volunteering with the school programs at Langley Centennial Museum. Melissa, why don't you tell the camera? Hey Jackson, what do you think that is? I don't know. No, so that's that big gold thing. It's probably almost as big as you, hey? Or there's the green thing on the bottom there. McKinley, do you have any guesses? Either the gold or the green? Um. If you look really closely on the gold one, it actually says weight. It says no strings, honest weight. What might that have to do with the store? Do you have to weigh things sometimes in the store? Sometimes if you go and you buy, sometimes yeah, what's that? Stores, you have to um, weigh like the, your fruits and veggies. Yeah, exactly. So you have to weigh things sometimes because sometimes things are, they go, the cost goes by weight. So exactly. So if you have to weigh your fruits and veggies, in the general store, they also have scales. So here, I'll hit play, and then we can see what they are. Or the audience. Well, are. the two big items here is, one, this uh, goldy um, big thing is actually a scale. So they might weigh sugar, uh, flour on this. This screen machine is actually a cheese cutter. So you would have a big round 
uh, block achieved and this would lift up. I can't do it because it is tied for safety, but it would lift up and you would cut your triangle achieved. We also have, not so big, but we have brown paper that the cheese and even meat, um, if it was in stock, would be wrapped in. We would have string. I would actually show you the string. And I know it's hard to see from because of the video, but a uh, great big long spool of string and the parcels would be wrapped with the string and maybe sealed with a brown tape, if you can see. So it would just pull and then cut off. Uh, so that was sort of the packaging and wrapping. They had no fabric bags. They had no cloth bags uh, or plastic. Or plastic. Mm -hmm. I was just going to yeah. hit that to the plastic. But um, some things that did come in fabric, though, were the flower. And we'll get to that in one second as we move. As we move down the store. So we have the flask or the, um, I should say, the fabric flower bag. And outside of the museum, I am an artist, and I do like to upcycle. And this is one of the most intriguing upcycling items that there is uh, from back in the day. A flower sack would be sewn into bloomers, or what some might know today is underwear. Um, so how, how would you feel wearing a flower sack as your underwear? Would you wear a flower sack underwear? Is it cotton? It is cotton. Cotton would be fine. <laughs> Not the scratchy stuff. No. And so some of the other things are, this is interesting. The door, any idea what this might be? What do you guys think that is? That's lots of piece holding. What does it look like to you? Does it look familiar? Um, it kind of looks like that, like the, what you put tea in and then you put it into the cups. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? It looks like a, a teapot or it looks like a cooking pot. You might be surprised to find out what it actually is. <laughs> well, I know it shouldn't be kept with a bag of flour. No, it should go under the bed. It's actually a chamber pot. So it's one of the unique items in the store that you will find. Because in the pioneer times in Langley and in the Fraser Valley, most houses did not have indoor plumbing, including washrooms. That was the washroom. <laughs> and if you wanted something a bit nicer than the chamber pot Melissa just showed you, that marvelous catalog we saw earlier, you could order a very nice set or just a set of nicer chamber pot. And depending how many people you had in the house, you would probably want one of those for every bedroom, or at least to go under every bed. A gazanda. A gazanda. <laughs> but not, does not go under <laughs> the flower sack. Yes, Mackenzie? McKenley, sorry. Um, um, when I went to the fort, um, in one of the bedrooms, there was one of those. You, yeah, I bet you've seen some of those in museums, hey? Can you imagine having to use that as your toilet every day? Now, if you were um, the pioneer days, so there were the pioneer families who lived on the farm, um, but there was different, you know, classes of people. So the people who were maybe the factory owners who had more money and bigger houses, they would have had a household staff. So somebody would have been working to take care of the home. Um, but part of their job would be to empty, empty those chamber pots every day. Um, some of the families with a bit more money in the 20s and the 1930s did actually start to have running water in their homes or beside their home. They might have had what we would call an outhouse today, but like a little building with a toilet and a sink. But the chamber pots, even by the upper class of people, were still used for nighttime because unlike us, like I've got a bathroom right beside me. It's easy, it's easy for me to go every time. The pioneer families, though, we didn't see a lot of running water in the homes. They had their well water and they had to go fill up their buckets. So any water that was in their home had to come from the well. Here, okay, we'll just keep going. We'll just watch a couple more minutes of this because I want to show you the post office and the phone. And then we're, we're just about at time. And above the flower sack and the chamber pot, we have um, the post office. 
So as a child, I loved writing to my pen pals all over the country, uh, all over the world. It didn't take as long as it did back then to post a letter, but the post office was part of the general store. Uh, you would have little slots, so they would be numbered uh, to your home or your family. Um, but you can see within here, they're all brown paper packages, kind of. And let's see, let's, we're going to pick one out. We have a postcard. We still send postcards today. Into little little stamps, parcels. Parcels still came in, as they say, um, the brown paper packages. And the big one that Midori has, the big parcels would also come in. They would not have had mail delivery to the house, which is why the general store has a post office. Now, this kind of parcel could be a special present. It could also be something that was ordered from a catalog to be delivered to the general store. My boots. Your boots. Bigger china doll or porcelain doll. And you would probably have to really order in advance. Mm -hmm. Not like today, where you can order and you might get your order within one or maybe two weeks or even less than one week. Yeah. If you were wanting to order your boots in time for fall, you would probably want to order them by the end of June yeah. to make certain they arrived here when fall weather started and you were going to need them. And again, if you're giving a China doll or a special toy that had to be ordered through a, a catalog, you wanted it here for perhaps Christmas, you would be wanting to order that beginning of October to make certain because most of the catalogs were based in Montreal or Toronto. And your order would go through by mail, mm -hmm. they would process it in person, and the order would be sent out by mail. And remember, Pioneer Times, there's no air mail. It's not coming by airplane. It'll be coming by automobile and or train. Horse and buggy sometimes too. Horse and buggy. Even in the little community. You know, yes, in the, in the very rural parts of Langley mm -hmm. in the Pioneer days, they still would have been using a lot of horses and horses and buggies even into the 1920s. Yeah. So we have this part of the communication that um, in the pioneer days they use, but we also have a special item in the corner used for local communication. Can you talk about that, Minori? Now this was one of my favorite things in, in the general store. And growing up, a few families that I knew also had a wall full. This is a telephone. This is an early telephone, an early wall telephone. Now, when I was a child growing up, there were still a few family friends and family members that had wall, a telephone that was attached to the wall in their house. Not like this. Some of them had an antique one made out of wood and metal, like this. But a lot of them, it was the telephone of the era from the 60s or 70s that was still attached to the wall. Now, you might be asking, why? Why is there a telephone here? Businesses today have telephones. But in the pioneer time, telephones were not in every house. So... If someone was needing to make a phone call, they would perhaps pay a small amount of money to the store owner to use the phone, telephone in the store. And if someone was wanting to actually speak to you on the phone, knowing that you did not have a telephone, they might call it to the store to say, I would like to speak to Melissa on Monday at 4.30 p.m. Melissa would get the message to be at the store for 4.30 p.m. on Monday so she could receive the telephone call from perhaps an aunt in Vancouver, or an uncle or cousin in New Westminster, mainly for locals. You would have to speak into this, and you would have to hold this to your ear, like this. And you can turn it to get the connection. And you would actually have to speak to a telephone operator to connect you to whatever number you were, talk you were wanting to speak to. It wasn't all automatic like it is today or behind the scenes. You speak to the operator, and sometimes, if it's a small community, you can even actually ask to speak to, I would like to speak to Roger Smith in New Westminster, and did not have as many people back then. There might have only been one Roger Smith in New Westminster, and the operator would know exactly who you were wanting to speak to and how to connect you to that person that you were wanting to call. We were just listening to Midori talk about the old-fashioned phone. So, McKinley and Jackson, if you need to make a phone call, what do you do? I'll pick up the phone and dial the number. Right? Like, I pick up my phone, I wake it up, I tap, you know, Haley's name, and then I call Haley. It's that easy, right? 
So in the pioneer times, especially, you know how he talks about how the the families with a bit more money maybe had toilets outside of their homes. In the 1920s and 1930s, those families would have started to have phones in their homes too. But the pioneer families, especially the, the families that lived out on the farm, we did not see phones in the household for quite a long time. Um, they were very expensive. They were very hard to get out there. So if you had to make a phone call, if you were a pioneer child 100 years ago, if you wanted to call your aunt in Vancouver, you had to say, Mom, we have to go to the dental store. So you'd get on your horse and buggy, or you'd get on your snow boots, you'd walk to the general store, you'd wait in line, you'd ask the shop owner to dial the phone operator who would then try to connect you to your, to your aunt. If your aunt was trying to call you, you'd have to know exactly what time she's going to call the store so you could be there waiting. That's a lot of work, isn't it? Oh, it's a bit tiring just even thinking about it. We're so lucky to have such great communication these days.